we've launched the green hydrogen catapult with the belief that we can make with a number of other companies. It's seven companies, Iberdrola, Yara, Orsted, uh, Aquamarine, and Vision from China. They call us the seven sisters of hydrogen. We think we can make green hydrogen made from renewable sources competitive with fossil fuels within five years. That means $2 a kilo. So it's happening really quickly. Uh, the good news is it will use existing infrastructure. So no need to develop new infrastructure. It can use the existing pipelines. And we can make essentially synthetic gas from solar or wind energy at very competitive prices. This is a breakthrough. Yeah, Marco, the, the challenge has always been, it seems to me, in the gas market, uh, transportability. And that, that's where it's always been a challenge to try and get a spot price globally that everybody can work with. Um, how close do you think we are to a serious tipping point now in a global gas spot benchmark that everybody can work with? Well, the logistics of the gas infrastructure are a lot more complex than oil. Wherever you have oil, you can transport it somewhere, somehow, whether it's on a train, uh, on a truck, on a ship, on a pipeline. When it comes to gas, if you don't have a pipeline that is very cheap to transport gas over huge distances, just think that when we turn on the heating here in Milan, the gas comes from 4,000 kilometers away in Russia. It travels at 40 miles an hour. It takes about five days. Uh, if you have to transport it via ship, you need to liquefy the gas, put it on a ship, which is cryogenic, has to keep it very cold, very cool. And then the ship has to get to a port with a regasifier. That logistical chain is worth as much as the gas commodity itself. That's why where you have a pipeline market, like in the US, the gas is around 2 to $3.00. When you have to go through that complex project, you get to $6. That doesn't mean we don't have a global price. We have a global price for LNG with Europe and Asia. Let's say the LNG importing countries are all importing at around the same price. And then you have prices, of course, in, in, in Russia or where you produce gas, which are incredibly low for domestic reasons. And then you have the U.S., which is a market in its, in its own. The challenge, though, is to accelerate that process, isn't it? Um, just tell us, what do you think will be the key markers this year when it comes to really ramping up demand? So demand has been incredibly resilient for gas because gas has been used for power and for heating. And as people were away from the offices, they were spending more time at home. So we've only seen at least in Italy a 2.5% uh, drop. The gas demand is going to recover very strongly. We see uh, China with a lot of strong demand. We see Europe as Germany and other countries continue to phase out coal, and Germany will also phase out nuclear. We see in the medium term gas demand uh, really picking up strongly. We see a big role for gas in transport. LNG uh, to move trains and trucks is a lot cheaper than diesel. So we'll see a lot of diesel to LNG switching as well. But when it comes to harmonizing prices, I think we will live uh, with the US being a cheaper market than Europe for gas because of that logistics chain that I mentioned. And there's not much you can do to compress that. So the US is always going to be enjoying uh, cheaper gas than Europe and Asia. I think demand in China will surprise us on the upside. and that will, that will drive to prices. Also, let's keep in mind that natural gas is a very seasonal a commodity. Most of the demand for natural gas is in the northern hemisphere. We use that for heating. And so when it's cold in China, it's cold in Europe, it's cold in the East Coast. We, we have the same winter. There's not a lot of gas consumed in the southern hemisphere. So a lot of seasonality with a lot of room for people investing in storage to be able to capture those spreads between summer and winter.